They lifted their first European Cup in 1977. And just seven years later, throughout that period, they collected major honors every single season and in the process established themselves as European football's dominant force. For an English club, it was an unprecedented level of consistent success, something to rank with the best runs in football history. I think how, how great they were. But at the time, you, you, you just seemed to take it for granted because Liverpool at that time were the club to play for. They were the dominant team, had the best players, and it was an absolute disaster if at the end of the season they only, only had one, one trophy. You know, it was just, you were expected to win things. Bob Paisley was promoted from assistant following the shock resignation of one of football's most celebrated managers, Bill Shankly. He came in and quite simply said, he said, look lads, you know, Shanks has gone, uh, none of us wanted that, certainly I didn't want it, um, but he has and somebody's got to take this club on. Um, and he said, I'm the one that's going to do it, but he said, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to change anything. He always felt that continuity was, was the right thing at the football club. Shanks had been there long enough to sort of, he'd set the foundations, and I don't just mean that's foundation, you know, the football club and he changed, you know, the, the training complex and this, that and the other. Bill Shankly made Liverpool into a club universally known and respected and a power, but Bob Paisley made them a great European power, the kings of the continent. But Paisley did not work alone. The club's commitment to continuity also applied to his backroom staff. Joe Fagan, Ronnie Moran and Roy Evans would end up with over 100 years of Anfield service between them. Within two years, Paisley led the Reds to the UEFA Cup and league title. But the following season proved to be even more significant. Liverpool again captured the league championship. A bigger prize still lay ahead. The European Cup final in 1977, you just knew everybody was so excited. This was a culmination of everything, what Shanks, what Bob, what Joe and Ronnie and the board had all worked for. It showed you how far they'd developed from the team Shanks had left behind in 74. Three years later, there was this fantastic team, much more sophisticated than the one Shanks had left. Bob had moved it on into that European level, which it needed, obviously. Thousands of Liverpudlians made the journey to Rome for the club's first ever European Cup. Now, Liverpool are heading for European glory. West German champions Borussia Mönchengladbach were soundly beaten 3-1. To win that European Cup was a special, special event, a special event for everybody. It was a fantastic performance by Liverpool. It was one of those perfect occasions. The weather was good, the fans were impeccable, the opposition was quite testing, but a brilliant side much in Gladbach. A domestic and European double had been achieved once again, only this time Liverpool were European champions. By now, the club's team before individual ethos was well established. Even the departure of the talisman Kevin Keegan caused a minimum of fuss. Kenny Dalglish arrived from Celtic for a British record transfer fee in the summer of 1977 and was joined at Anfield by two more Scots. All three would have historic impact. Great players were replaced, they came and went, but the spirit in that dress room was saying to none, it really was, it was like phenomenal. My first game for Liverpool, I plucked up the courage to Joe, I trained for a week, no one's told me what you want me to do. And a big booming voice, I can't tell you the first two words he said, but the, the second word was off, and it was, we paid all this money for you and you were asking me how to play football, and walked away. And by that time, all the lads were looking at me, 
laughing. So I never ever asked again. The first day we came training, the lads were as hungry for success that year as what they must have been the previous year. So oh, that's what they made. Liverpool reached the European Cup final again in 1978 and against FC Bruges at Wembley, were bidding to become the first British team to retain the trophy. Kenny Dalglish was proving a bargain. I had my back to goal on the, on the goal line and I don't know, it was Terry Mike chipped in or something. I knocked it and bought with my... A one-nothing win meant a hero's welcome back on Merseyside. It was becoming a familiar sight. The manager of Paisley, Joe Fagan, Ronnie Moran, who the players sort of had more sort of interaction with every day, they kept it very simple. There was no magic formula. The great players sacrificed any, anything on an individual basis for the team. I never liked running a bit much, but I really enjoyed the training, you know, the laughter, the, the togetherness. <laughs> That's not very nice, is it? Hey, you weren't here when I used to you stand here. You weren't here, lad. You never used to stand on here. No. Pride and joy, this lad. But hard work and team spirit weren't enough on their own. Trevor Francis regularly faced the Reds as his Nottingham Forest side vied with Liverpool for top honours. Any good team you build from the back. And I think of the likes of, you know, Clements. Great goalkeeper. You look at goalkeepers, you think there's a mistake there, or he's going to save us. And Clem is that every time. He's going to save us. He's going to get us at the moment. Alan Kennedy was an attacking left back. He was a fantastic guy, and he was a great player. The goals he scored, and, and obviously the big cup finals, were great. Great left foot, good defender, and great pace. And uh, that's what you want a full back. There was Neil. What a signing he was. People don't realise, 23 years of age, and he's played all these games and won all these medals. For me, he was absolutely wonderful and top class. Phil Thompson and myself were, were, I think, the best partnership I played. Tom and I were like, it was telepathic. I mean, we played a, a team that, in 42 league games, lost 16 goals. And it was just, he was just unbelievable to play with. My strong points were definitely my positioning and reading and on the ball, and he was the same. Terry McDermott from the centre of midfield, we had a bet at the start of every season, two of us in the centre of midfield, who would score the most goals. It was a joke. I would get six, he'd get 26. And by Christmas time, he'd be holding his hand out and I had to pay him. You know, he'd sit in front of the lad, so I couldn't refuse the bet. Every pre-season, every Christmas time, I paid up. Case, McDermott, soon as Ray Kennedy, they had everything in there. They had they had pace in there, they had, that, they had strength, brilliant in there. Ray Kenny was the best midfield player in there that I've ever seen. But above all, every one of them was totally comfortable with the ball at their feet. And I don't think you'll ever get a better midfield quartet than that. And up front, they had such a cutting edge, you know, the likes of Dog Leash and Rush. I mean, those two will go down as two of the all-time greats at, 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 at Anfield. So we are talking about special players that were molded into a special team. Off the pitch, the bootroom boys, as they were known, were an integral part of the success story. The bootroom staff were, were totally part of everything. You know, we're in this together. It's not just about, it's not the players are there. I mean, there's very much a, you knew it was them and us, but when it came to the matters on the pitch, it was like all together, you know, the bootroom staff, everybody was involved in it. The likes of, you know, Joe Fagan, Ronnie Morant, Roy Evans, they were absolutely fantastic behind the scenes, just reminded, reminded you what your job is, the badge, and who you're playing for. Nothing's complicated for them, we just go out and try and do the simple things. We try to pass this on to each player individually and net it into a teamwork and then they go out and they do it. On and off the field, the players knew what was required of them even if pre-match routines were occasionally unorthodox. When I first went to Liverpool, they'd watch the 2 o'clock race, the 2.15 race, the 2.30 race, and if it was five furlongs, they might get the 2.35. And, but the thing is, like, four players would come in the dressing room and then the manager after, because Bob would be watching the racing as well. Come in, 2.35, so no warm-up. I never used to warm-up, I used to touch my toes, go and play. I always have a sense of Liverpool, if, I mean, within reason, what is right for you, then that's fine. At that time at Liverpool, they give you a responsibility, which I think is missing in the modern game. 
The one thing they would say to us before we went out on a Saturday at three o'clock was be together, and we always were. When you come under pressure, you come under pressure as a team, not as an individual. Successive league titles followed in 1979 and 80 as Liverpool fought to maintain dominance. Brian Clough's hungry Nottingham Forest side were pushing them hard for the major titles. A rivalry flourished, but there was also mutual respect. That Liverpool team never gets the credit for being one of the top sides, not only domestically, but in European football, where they've had to come in and play heavy domestic programme, as heavy as any, and, and still come up big in the, in the European games. We had really, really good players, some really, really good players, and some truly great players that could have gone anywhere in the world and gotten any team anywhere in the world at that time. And that, coupled with honesty and hard work, made them a formidable force. They were as good a side that has held that European trophy aloft, and they were as good a side as any. During this period of relentless domination, the Football League Cup had remained elusive. Alan Hansen's winner in the replayed final of 1981 against West Ham ended that particular drought. The same season also saw Liverpool cruise through to the quarter-finals of the European Cup, where a Sunas hat-trick helped them to a 6-1 aggregate success against CSKA Sofia. The resulting semi-final was an epic struggle against West German champions Bayern Munich. We drew nil at Anfield, Paul Breitner um, said a few disparaging words about us after the game. We go across there, there's leaflets in every seat in the stadium, so we get to a couple of Liverpool supporters who are in early to show us what the, what's in the leaflet, and of course it's the road to Paris to the final. Well, I've never ever seen a Liverpool dressing, dress room more fired up than I did that night. It was incredible. The two substitutes had been used, and then Dave Johnson got a hamstring and he was limping in the right wing, so with ten men, Kenny had gone off, and we scored, and Ruben had scored in, in the final minute. But it was, it was the best dress room I've ever been in that dress room. They were, were battering the, the Bayern Munich door done, and the, everybody was going crazy. To be part of that was, was extra special. That night in, in Munich it was one of, you know, one of the great nights in Liverpool's history. That's our 113th European Cup tie, and uh, we had some great ones. The Rome one in particular it was magnificent. But tonight, I thought that was our best performance. Even better was to come as once again the Liverpool supporters travelled in huge numbers to foreign. I don't remember too much about. <laughs> I remember too much about the afterward. That was a good part of it. You always had a. You always had a good celebration. The sad part was you, you couldn't remember it. Bob Paisley said in uh, '77 in Rome, he said he never had a drink. He said he wanted to get drunk in the atmosphere and enjoy the moment and remember it. I never listened to Bob's advice. <laughs> Liverpool's supporters were now accustomed to success, but their relationship with the players was always a two-way affair. All right, lads. At that time, they truly believed in us, and um, we believed in them, and I think we proved that, because we didn't lose too many at Anfield. And there was never that feeling coming from the crowd, any part of the stadium, that when we maybe went a goal behind, or we had lost a week before and we weren't playing well, that, that was the, the, the negativity was coming onto the pitch. It was such a great place to play. I mean, the sign, for example, when you walk you know, down the tunnel, I mean, I still touch the sign the same way as I always did on a Saturday. It's just, I can't get away from, from touching that sign with the two hands like that. It was a period during which Anfield had become something of a fortress. Over the nine seasons from 1975 until 1984, the club played 263 competitive home games and lost only 15. This included an 85-match unbeaten run between 1978 and 1981. The trophies continued to arrive. 1982 brought another league title, 
as Liverpool clinched Championship number 13 at home to Tottenham.